morning, everybody. I am really surprised with the amount of people coming here. So let's start with checking out if everybody's in the right room. <laughs> Who knows what OpenMP is? That's a good score. <laughs> Who has used it before? Who wants to use it? <laughs> Who hates to use it? <laughs> Even the, okay, good. Um, let's see if we can reconvince you. <laughs> okay, does this sound familiar? I hear a few people laughing, so probably it is. But isn't this the usual problem you're fighting when you're doing multi threaded programming? It sometimes works, thanks to something called Eisenbachs, which you don't see if you look at it. And they do appear when you're not looking. Um, so, Let's try to avoid those race conditions by actually making correct code. And then we introduce OpenMP. Um, okay, uh, this is me. I have um, some kind of a dangerous hobby in trying to fly without an engine. And other than that, well, I work for a company who is focusing on doing multi-core programming. So we do training, we do consultancy, and we have a tool to actually take source code, analyze its operation, and work with you to together make it parallel. But of course, I'm not here to make an advertisement, so let's do a small deep dive into OpenMP. If you want to do proper software optimization, you can do that at three different levels. You can do it at the top algorithm level, which is what all those scientific guys are doing. Are those scientific guys in the room, by the way? Everybody else is a programmer? Okay, so about half of the room are neither. Okay, cool. <laughs> Sysadmins? Yes, a few? Okay. So the second, uh, once you have the best algorithm you can find, you need to find the best coder you can find, so you get the best C code. And that's where a lot of work can be spent using OpenMP to get it as optimal as possible to make as much use of the hardware resources you have. And only then start worrying about that third level, getting to the best assembly code, the best machine code you can. Of course, anyone writing an HPC problem in Python is building that third option out of the box, um, but it's an important step. Compilers tend not to write optimal code, but tend to do a reasonable job at it. So you need to help them to get to the best level. Again, something open and can help. So what is OpenMP? Apparently everybody already knew, so um, yeah, it's this. It has been around for a while already. Of course, at oh, even more people. It originally started out when different vendors realized, hey, we need some kind of a paradigm to attack those multi-core systems that slowly start appearing. Almost at the same time, multi-core systems started disappearing again. So OpenMP went in the limbo for a while. And uh, by the end of the 90s, it researched People also started getting interested in C, and by now OpenMP4 is mostly talking about C and does Fortran on the side. Support for OpenMP is still catching up, especially on the Microsoft front, it's still um, lacking at that. And as of about a year ago, even people using Clang start becoming happy because OpenMP is coming to Clang. Finally, code. It took me 15 slides to get to code. Oops. Um, OpenMP is, let's, <coughs> for now I'm going to show most of my examples using GCC. Only in the end I will talk a little bit about the Intel compiler. 
in both cases, you use dash f open and peep in order to say, hey, dear compiler, uh, I want to compile with open and peep enabled. At that point, the compiler will understand that you have a dash pragma OMP. One very important paradigm of open and peep, dating back to the C standard, if you see a pragma that you don't understand, you ignore it. Which means that this code should, should, be the same if you compile it with OpenMP or without. Unfortunately, there are two examples in this entire tutorial set that do not adhere to that principle. This is one. Because if you ignore the pragma, you would only get one printf statement. And if you compile with OpenMP, you get four. So that's not the same. So technically, this is an illegal OpenMP program. Okay. So once you compiled it, uh, so we have an include file. We have different member of uh, function calls to actually get things like get a number of threads, get get my thread number. Thread number starts counting at zero. That's why we get four threads and. As usual, they do not appear nicely in order. If there's anyone still surprised that they do not appear in order, we need to talk. <laughs> <laughs> so, OpenMP is meant to be used incrementally. You start with working code, sequential working code, <coughs> only then you start applying OpenMP pragmas which means that you always can check back whether your code still works as it should. And um, the second advantage is that you always have that sequential algorithm available so your scientist can walk back, think a little bit more about some optimization without screwing over everything. Let's make it slightly more complicated. Um, now I only have a pragma in the middle, so we start sequential. There's only one thread. Then we go to a parallel team. So each each thread of the team will execute the printf. And as you can tell, there are now four threads in my team, and yet another in order. Once this block is done, so this pragma only applies to the next code block, which is in this case one line, we go, the team goes back to sleep, I only have one thread left, so that's why I have one thread in the end. Well, nobody looks surprised, that's good. Um, there are four work well, several work sharing constructs in OpenMP. The easiest one conceptually is OpenMP single. At least on the search it's simple. Essentially it means there's only one thread executing what is in between. The hard part is figuring out which thread. And what are the others doing at the same time. So that's I'm going to ignore that for now, but that's where the problem with OMP single is. OMP sections and OMP4 I'll discuss very soon. All three say something about the next piece of code, how threads will operate with that next piece of code. Let's go to OMP parallels. So, sorry, OMP sections. Um, first you annotate, okay, I'm going to have a block with sections in it, and essentially we define three sections, which are run in parallel by three different threads. So, um, if you have four threads, that means that one thread is still idling in this code, and the other three threads in parallel will initialize by matrices, and after the section the sections is done, I still have one thread that will do some computation with the three of the matrix. Unfortunately, 
if you are working with multiple threads, you will face at some point the situation where you have threads that need local data, that need data that is not shared. We'll see quite a few examples further down in the slides. But you need to start paying attention to which memory is allocated where. Especially if you have numerous systems, um, that is getting really <coughs> hairy, but I don't want to talk about that in just a tutorial. So for now, let's assume we have a flat memory system. All the memory is at the same cost accessible by all processors. Still, we need to worry about what variables are private to a thread and what variables are not private to a thread. So that's why OpenP introduces different concepts to identify, for example, if I say default none, none of the variables allocated available so far will be part, will be visible to my thread. Well, that's not really useful. So that's when you can say, okay, I want a variable shared. I can read from it. Whatever I write with will be visible <coughs> to all other threads at some point. I can say I want the variable first private. The original value that variable has comes in. I can use it. And whatever I do with it goes away when I actually end my task. So if you have four threads that each have first private on a variable, all four will work with the initial value, and all four will discard the value afterwards. Last private is exactly the opposite. The variable does exist, it does not get an initialization, and the result will be copied out. So if you have four threads having the same variable as last private, the enforcing price. Let's try to put this into use. So this is the default. I put a shared here, which really doesn't make much sense because shared is the implied default. Um, so let's make it harder. I still have my three matrix pointers. I'm still going to initialize them, but now I have a shared here, a first private here, and a last private there. What is my outcome? Let's start with um, M3. Is the bump going bigger? Um, so, okay, M3. Who dares? What happens to M3? Yes. So the M3 end result is copied out. There's only one M3, so we're happy. M2. Thread is uh, processed first. Okay, Be explain. Because uh, it's, uh, it's shared um, in the first uh, thread, but it's also um, exported uh, in, in the last thread. So it's uh, which one the closest, latest. Um, but there's uh, two okay. initializing in, in the last bit, so hopefully yes. that's the one that uh, ends like latest. So I, I would guess the last thread. I wouldn't dare to make that guess. <laughs> <laughs> You're very 
likely right, but I wouldn't bet my life on it. No, <laughs> me neither. But <laughs> <laughs> so, um, indeed, M1 is initialized twice. No, a local copy of M1 is initialized twice. In one case, the local copy is the shared copy. In one case, the local copy is actually copied over. Because we're talking about a pointer, we probably, no, probably, will wind up with a valid pointer in the end. Again, no guarantees here. So always use default none when you start coding to actually make sure that all variables are initialized like you expect. And once you get to the stage that everything works as expected, I suggest to keep it there. So if your scientific guy comes around and starts messing with the code, or your dear co-worker who understands the last thing you do, all of you have one, right? Or your boss comes around, <laughs> um, the default none will prevent him or her from going out. And of course, I'm going to not use default up. Yes? Maybe a question with the previous call. Uh, with the initialization of M1 and M2, I'm not sure, but aren't we going to have uh, memory leaks if we are doing some uh, dynamic variable? Uh, what happens to the first initialized M1 and what happens to the uselessly initialized M2? Do they, are they local, even if dynamically uh, allocated, or uh, does it uh, pollute the memory space? I love the question, thank you. Uh, <laughs> who dares to answer that question? What happens to M2? The initialized M2? Well, it, it really depends uh, uh, what this initialized matrix does. Yeah. If it returns pointer to some buffer or whatever, or if it makes bulk and, and allocates memory. Well, I would guess that matrix is some kind of a pointer to something. And then the big question is, is it a shared pointer or is it just a pure C pointer? If it's a shared pointer, you may actually get away without the memory leak. Usually, this is just a big memory leak because, yes, initialized matrix will have melted <laughs> something, will have filled it up, and the pointer is just thrown away. Okay, so. And C doesn't do garbage collection. <laughs> Thanks. Love this kind of questions though. Keep them going. <laughs> um, is there a performance probably for leaving just before the moment as in the code? That's the wooden expect. Not that I'm aware of. Okay. So so I, I don't expect very much penalty. The only thing you do is <coughs> actually make it more straight. The codes that you generate should be the same. Um, well, I guess everybody's seen an example of this style before when you start talking about parallelization. So, just some dump matrix multiplication. Let's multiply M1 with M2 and put the result in rest. How many ways can we parallelize it? Well, quite a few. Shall we go for three? Let's take the smart one first. Which one is the smartest to parallelize? Four. four? Oh, you mean line four? No, no, the four loops. Absolutely. So, four loops. Sounds like a good plan. Which four loop makes most sense to parallelize? Can somebody speak up a little bit because I'm a bit deaf? Line eight. Line eight. So, if you make this one parallel, we will do that, but it's probably the least performant one because you will constantly start the team, stop the team, get in line 8 again, start the team again, they will do a little bit of parallel computation, stop the team again, go away. So it is important that you want to parallelize, if you start parallelizing loops, take the highest loop you can find, because the highest loop you can find has the 
most body, the most time it spends in an iteration. So the starting and stopping time of a thread has less impact on the overall compute time. That makes sense? Okay. Well, Part of how OpenMP works is that it adheres to something called the four join pattern. So every time you hit a parallel fork, which will be in the next slide, at that point the threads will be created or woken up. They will perform all the iterations of the four in parallel. Once the iterations are done, the threads are put to sleep, put in a thread pool, whatever, at least they stop working for me. Only one thread continues until it hits the next one. Make sense? So this way um, the programmer still has his sequential behavior. There is no thread going astray doing weird stuff. No, you have still your sequential behavior, but you take the performance, you spread it over more threads when you can. So let's paralyze the top part because it has the most body. So I throw in a parallel form. That's nice. So that means that this form, it will take all the rows and start spreading them up. Okay, the first set of rows goes to thread one, the second set of rows goes to thread two, etc., etc. How the spread split up of the rows across the threads is done will be the next slide. But wait a minute, there's a private call and a private K there. Why would I need those? Yeah. So I need to make call private because every thread needs its own copy of call or they will start messing with each other. Agreed. The same is true for K. And of course, if you're programming C99, you could have just said for int call here. And you wouldn't have needed to do this. But if you are stuck with your boss specifying Kernan and Richie C, this is what you have to do. Um, okay, so we're going to use private when needed. If you are the lucky bastard who can use C++, instead of kerning them in C, at least you'll be happy to see that OpenMP allows for uh, STL iterators. Um, I haven't seen any OpenMP statement about the range operators in C++11 yet. I would expect that it's in there, but I haven't checked. Um, one thing we'll jump on in a minute, um, no branching in and out of the loop. No breaks, no continues, no exceptions. If you're seeing the plus plus. The reason for not doing that is obviously that you add a logic problem to your code if you have an early exit. Because if you have this amount of work done, you start sequentially and you go this way and you exit here, you know where you exit. If you have this amount of data and you split it up and you exit here, where was that thread? Where was that thread? So you have no clue what the status is of everything else you processed underneath. So from a logic point of view, introducing an early exit or it gets a cancel like it is now called an open MP4, usually doesn't make sense unless you really know what you're doing. Um, so that means you have to understand the code you're working on. So I have my big four, big, big set of iterations that I'm going to spread over. If I take a dynamic schedule, I'll have the first four go to four different threads, the second four go to the same threads. So thread one will take one, it will take five, it will take nine, etc., etc. Thread two will take two, six, 
Then, where the static schedule will say, okay, 1, 2, and 100 go to thread 1, 101 to 200 go to thread 2, etc. Why do you need to have the choice between the two? Why are both valid choices for some situations and not valid choices for every situation? Excuse me? Um, NUMA definitely has an impact on this, but it's not the answer I'm looking for. Because that's a low level answer, you're right, it has impact in some cases, but there's a much more obvious reason why this sometimes makes sense. Absolutely correct. Step point. So, this is indeed a problem of load balancing. If I have a series of jobs and every next iteration takes longer to compute, say prime numbers, it would be really bad if thread 1 takes the 100 easiest ones and thread 4 takes the, one, the 100 slowest ones because that means that, well, that's a bit unequal. So at that point you want to have them jump over each other, a route robin schedule, to make sure that they try to spread it as nicely as possible. If you have an equal load across every iteration, the static schedule probably fits closer to what you expect. As soon as you start putting cache behavior, locality of memory into play, um, things get significantly hairier, which is beyond what I want to talk about today. If you need that, don't get this. So, I do want to do this in other Let's put the pragma parallel for on that inner loop. And just so to keep people in mind that uh, we're sharing all variables that were declared before, I make explicit and put shared term there. What will fail? <coughs> Nobody? Everybody would happily use this code. Uh -huh. Which means that we know for sure 
thanks to underlying mechanisms in the processor and mostly in the cache mechanism of the processor, that every write will succeed. So I will read the value, add to it, write it, and I'm pretty sure that no one else will be in between this read, modify, write action. <coughs> That's what atomic promises. The disadvantage of using atomic is that as long as uh, the thread holds that cache line where the TMP variable is in for itself, no one else can claim it, no one else can write to it, so all other threads have to wait. Especially if you are in such a small loop like this one, essentially you are sequentializing your code again. However, if you would have um, TMP as an array, for example because you're doing some kind of histogram calculation, <coughs> atomic may be the best way to go forward. Name. <coughs> No. <laughs> Thanks for asking. So the question is, is atomics is an atomic a mutex? The answer is a very big no. It's actually the reverse, but I'll get to that. Um, what is important is that <coughs> an atomic is on cache level, very down in the processor, where if the processor writes to memory, well, reads from memory, modifies the writes to memory, it will say, okay, that position is for me, nobody is allowed to touch it in between. So we're talking about holding that line for four or five cycles. Going up to a mutex, the mutex says, okay, if I claim this mutex, which is a variable, no one else is allowed to claim this variable while I hold it. So anyone who claims that wants to claim a variable why I hold it will be put to sleep. That's at least a thousand cycles. And will only be woken up when I exit let go of my mutex. Waking up a thread and getting it to run is probably <coughs> another two thousand cycles. So three thousand cycles versus five cycles. There's a very big difference in the number of cycles. <laughs> Um, atomics should work on any cache coherent system. Because that's one of the three parameters to be cache coherent. Can I complete my mutex versus atomic story? The only way to write a mutex is using atomics. Just to put it, them into perspective. There were three different ones. I'm essentially sequentializing the code again. So yes, I will have four threads who all have to wait at cache level before they can read modified write as variable. What happens if I use this to forbid variable and my new architecture doesn't support two different variables? Sixty-four bits, but only like two bits. You don't. Oh. So what happens? What happens if you have, well let's make it slightly broader, what happens if you have an atomic operation done on a structure that your processor cannot handle atomically in assembly code? So, um, for example if you use this in C++11, where, where you can say for any random type you can say, okay make this type atomic. C++11 would add mutexes underneath to protect all accesses. Let's discard C++ again. Um, if you do this in OpenMP, I bet you get a compiler. I've never tried it actually, but it makes sense that uh, at some point it will warn, hey, I'm trying to write something which I cannot do in a single operation. And then we are back to different architectures have different responsibilities. In ARM, um, no, I didn't put the slide in, sorry. Uh, in ARM what you see is if you do an atomic write, it will be um, essentially a load exclusive. So give me that cache line, give me the value of that cache line. That cache line is now mine. I write to it what I need to write, and at the end I check whether the cache line is still mine or whether somebody else stole it away. 
if somebody else stole it away, I'm going to redo my operation. <coughs> if you go to a 64 bit, so if you go to a larger structure, essentially this load exclusive and store exclusive get further away, which means that probably the test whether you still had it exclusive after the last ride will fail more often, so you have to redo it again. That's all. But that's in ARM, so you can solve this. It probably will be solved by, well, having to wait a few more times before it gets right. If you go to Intel, um, I believe there is no problem, because even on a 32-bit, you could already score 64-bit. <coughs> don't work. Let's take this offline because I only have 20 more minutes left. Um, I wouldn't try to do this with pinlocks. There's, oh, yes, one more. Can, can, can you start again? Yes. Let's make the question slightly simpler. Atomic means read, modify, write, all joined together. What happens if I have multiple writes in a single sentence? Or what if I have multiple reads and then do a write? What happens? If you are stuck with open in P3 or below, you are in bad shape because it wasn't specified in the, si in the system. Only in OpenMP 3.1 they added clauses to specifically be able to tell take that write or take that read or merge this and not that. So the R to OpenMP Atomic, there are clauses to specify closer behavior in case where people might start getting confused. That's why I love the question. I'm, I was going to ignore that just because there's so much to tell. But there are more clauses to open MP Atomic that will help you out in this kind of cases. There's the reduction. Um, open MP does have a specific trick to do this better, where essentially you specify, okay, I see a reduction expression in my loop. A reduction expression means that there is a variable that sees an operation, sees it in every iteration, it uses data, and all of the data and the operations can be interchanged. <coughs> so, in this case, I specify operation plus on variable T and P as being the reduction. So, addition is except when you're looking for talking floating point, uh, addition is something where you can change the operation. parallel for the requirement for 
this clause is that it has to be known prior for entering the forum. So it's that was the original requirement, but it's no longer the requirement. So the requirement now is you need to be able to predict at the start of the forum, you need to predict the end number, and it is not allowed to change during the forum. So instead of the plus operator, operator um, you are also allowed to use a few other operators like multiply, minimum, maximum, store into an unordered list. Things like that are all reductions. Starting with OpenMP4, you can even <coughs> declare your own function as being a reduction. Quite a bit hairy syntax, but you can make your own reduction functions. I'm quickly going to jump over a few other tricks, and then we're going to see a little bit more code. Um, I already discussed OP single. So what if you have a very expensive compute function that you want to split across multiple threads, and you can do so. So you have the team of threads attacking that compute. Then you have one operation that needs to be done by just a single thread because there's no way you can parallelize that part. So you can say, okay, on P single, only one thread will run that code, and only when that thread is completed, all other threads will continue. So that's <coughs> important to realize that there is a bearer at the end of on P single. All threads need to be there or no one continues. OMP barrier here is needed to make sure that all threads are done before we actually start doing the reshuffle. Otherwise we start reshuffling data that may not be complete yet. It's like a charm. <sighs> Essentially no. Because the threads, a barrier will keep all the threads alive. Where a joint will make them to the So if a barrier immediately is followed by another core. None of the threads will be put to sleep and all of the threads will immediately share the workload of the core and continue. Another nice construct, um, especially if you start working with recursive code, is using task. Essentially like a remote procedure call. <coughs> you can say, okay, I have this amount of work that needs to be done by somebody else. I don't care when you do it as long as the result is ready at some point. So in this case, we have a list reversal, where for each element in the list, we hand out the job to some task. All the tasks will be put into some kind of a queue, and all other threads in the team will empty this queue and move process. If you by accident have code where the ordering needs to be kept intact, yes you can. There is an open MP4 ordered where if you announce it up front, open MP can introduce enough code to make sure that the results can be printed in the same order they originally were. Um, there are a few requirements here, like there's only one order to be allowed in a single thread, a uh, single for loop. Don't expect magic performance here, because this takes a lot of synchronization underneath within OpenMP, so you will hand out performance. If you can get rid of the ordered requirement, <coughs> you can get 4x, Likely on an algorithm, if you have ordered in there, you are lucky if you get to enough. Ah, yes. Okay, sorry, smile! <laughs> <laughs> and I hadn't expected to have to see so many people, so <laughs> my boss will be happy. Smile! Oops. Sorry, <laughs> need to do that again. Yes. Smile in the middle. 
Smile on the right. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> so at least I can prove to my boss that um, yeah, it made, it made sense to come. <laughs> After all, he's paying for my hotel room. <laughs> um, okay, back to the topic. Um, something that we ran into quite a few times when we started toying with tasks is that you probably want to only parallelize, so fork off a task or parallelize for them if there's enough work to actually do so. Because waking up the team, putting the team back to sleep, takes time. That's in society. So if you can make a decision whether you want to start the team or not, that's convenient. And open a PDF of I think 3.0 has a clause to actually say, okay, I only want to do this in certain cases and keep as a single thread otherwise. Then we have a few other directives, or actually none of these are directives. No wait is a clause that you add to, for example, a single to indicate that um, all the other threads that are not busy can continue. So you can, this is improving parallelism in some cases. The critical is a critical section. So you can identify this piece of code. Only one thread is allowed to be there at the same time. All the, all the threads that enter this come at the beginning of the critical have to go through, but only one is allowed at the same time. That's very different from a single, right? Because a single says only one thread goes through and the rest jumps over. There's also a clause master, which identifies, okay, all threads that enter it, only the master is allowed to continue, and everybody else will jump to the end and continue afterwards immediately. They don't wait. Flush. Um, <laughs> if you have two threads, and I'm first this thread, and I'm going to write to three different variables, the compiler is allowed to reorder in which order I write to the variables because essentially from a C point of view I can't tell in which order the variables were written in the first place. I only know after the first all three have been written. Imagine that the last one you write is a flag and that flag is read by another thread and only when it sees the flag change it knows that everything is written and it continues. If your compiler starts reordering, or if your processor starts <coughs> reordering, those writes may not be in order, the flag may actually be written first, and only at that point, means that uh, the other track already starts working, starts reading those variables that haven't been written yet, so you get the old values. That's the type of case. This is First of all, this concept, memory reordering, is the cause of a lot of very, very, very subtle bugs. It will work forever and at some point start failing. Flush, or using atomics to set the flag, can help in making sure that there's no reordering done by either the processor or the compi uh, compiler or processor. In the training that I have on multi thread programming, the whole concept of memory reordering and all the details take one and a half hour. It's really tricky, really complicated. Most people never heard of it when they enter my training. Having said that, using flush everywhere is going to kill performance because every flush means that all the caches are flushed out to memory, which may be a significant performance. performance level. So only use it when you need to. And then we have a few things that I deliberately want to highlight it in OpenMP4. So OpenMP4 was released out of the summer last year. And um, there are a few nice new things in there that I do want to talk about. But let's do a bit of politics first. 
Because there was a small company called NVIDIA. You know, right? They make graphics cards. And they at some point started making something called CUDA to actually be able to program those graphics cards and have some nice advanced parallel code, of code execution on the graphics card. And then there was Uncle Sam, and he wanted a new supercomputer for his Department of Energy. And he said, I want an open protocol for that uh, GPU offloading. So NVIDIA looked around and said, shoot, CUDA is not open. It's just us, and we don't allow any of our competition to use the same protocols. Realizing there were two other standards already, OpenCL, started by Apple, mostly active by Altera and AMD at the time. Hmm, AMD is a good competitor of NVIDIA, so let's not. They are part of OpenCL, but no, let's not try to get everything in there and bank our future on it. Same for OpenMP. Um, OpenMP4 was already in the making. People were thinking about putting offloading in there. But the VIA needed the solution tomorrow. Not when it's ready. So in the end, they decided not to go with OpenMP, to go for an even faster track. So they contacted a few compiler builders, started working on something called OpenACC, tried to keep it as close to OpenMP as possible, with the thought that if the need arises, we can migrate everything that we now quickly prototype in OpenACC into OpenMP. Well, that's where we are now. OpenACC is in its second revision. Works like a charm if and only if you have a compiler made by PGI, Cray, or Caps. And the openness was threatened in last September when NVIDIA bought PGI. So at that point you have Cray and Caps, and Cray and Caps tend to work together anyway. So you essentially are stuck with two vendors providing new standards. <coughs> so at that point, uh, NVIDIA started paying mental graphics to actually put open ACC in GCC to make sure that open ACC remains an open standard. I would have preferred if they started paying mental graphics to make open MP work with NVIDIA cards. Sorry, that's not happening right now. Why this exercise? Well, just to make sure to explain, OpenMP4 does have target of load. You can say Pragma OP target. <coughs> to actually specify, okay, this code is not meant to run on my CPU, but offload it somewhere else. And somewhere in the future, we'll have NVIDIA support for it. But this is what it looks like. <coughs> Pragma OMP target, or if you have a large amount of code that you want to say all of this needs to go to the target segment. Pragma OMP declare target, la 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 la. Pragma OMP end target. You can spe specifically say, okay, I need this data to go to the device. Or if you say, okay, later, you can say, okay, update the contents of this truck in one or the other direction. Which tends to have <coughs> a problem with GPU offloading anyway. Getting the code to run on a GPU probably takes you a day or two. Getting it to run efficiently, faster than on your CPU, probably takes you the rest of the year. Because you need to be really worrying about the amount of data, making sure the data is in time on the GPU and is in time back for your host to continue computations, which is painful. What profiling tools do you want to track? So, NVIDIA obviously realized this very early on, so they made a profiler specifically to monitor what is happening on the GPU and how much data is going to and from the GPU. Um, V2 can do similar things. I'm not aware that any of the open source tools have that kind of tracking. I would have to say, all time. I'm not aware of it, but it's a good suggestion. I'll check it. Take it. Um, 
Open the PS all those nine. Nice hash pragma all of the parallel, right? Open shell start with this amount of shit code. <laughs> <laughs> So, conceptually, OpenCL and CUDA and OpenACC share a lot of common thought in that you take code, you offload it somewhere else, and you have to specify what that somewhere else is, and how you get the data over there, and how you get the code over there. The approach you take is very different. Um, in OpenCL, for <coughs> example, you take code, put it as ASCII in your binary, put the compiler in your binary and have it at runtime actually compile the code and offload it, which is a bit awkward. That's why you need the uh, What you do for CUDA, it's similar, but it's better hidden because in CUDA you compile to some kind of a bytecode which you hand to the graphics driver to figure it out. Similar Harry. Uh, it's just Yes, you're right. Uh, indeed, OpenCL has been fixing a few things to make it more competitive. So stupid guys like me don't burn it in front of the large audience. Um, OpenCL really works for very specific use cases, like CUDA works for very specific use cases. The beauty of OpenCL is that you can also offload to an FPGA, you can offload to a DSP, you can offload to a CPU, where CUDA can only offload to NVIDIA graphics cards. And I only have five minutes left, so I better start running. Um, <coughs> I don't think it surprises anyone if I say that this kind of offloading in OpenMP currently only works for one device, being the Intel Xeon 5. Because Intel is really pushing OpenMP4 as the default programming model for Xeon 5. So ICC, the Intel compiler, is currently the only one who has full support for targets. It's not present in Clang or GCC whatsoever, right now. Um, something else, factorization, there we are. Um, factorization was left to the compiler up to OpenMP4. Only in OpenMP4 they now add yet another mechanism to specify factorization, we only have four. So this is the fifth one, um, to actually say, okay, dear compiler, this loop should be possible to do with a factorized approach. So instead of doing one value at a time, Take a big register, say to like 56 bits, take eight floats at a time, process them all at the same time, write them back. That's now also part of OpenMP, so you get things like uh, pragma OMP parallel for SIMD, where you can say, okay, this for loop needs to be done in vector, and the beauty of OpenMP in that case is that you can also say, okay, I have this function that is also SIMD capable, but the compiler, I'm not using this in a branch, which means that you don't have to write complicated code to only supply certain values in your factor. You know that all the values in your factor will be processed. Okay, let's take let's check whether the Intel compiler actually makes sense of this. So I took to look at the assembly code, yes it does. And in a way that makes me wonder why Intel always shows this example. Because the return, so essentially the minus, of a minimum, is indeed done with one single minimum of a packed uh, set in one go. So yes, this is one bit line of C code turned into one single assembly statement. <coughs> The same for this nice uh, R RMS calculation. You this uh, subtract y from x, and then you multiply the result with itself. So, 
somehow this is a really nice fit and I wonder why Intel always takes this example to showcase <coughs> By the way, if you open up the assembly file, there will be four other versions as well. For example, if the last values do not fit exactly in your vector, so they have a special case for that, and they have a special case in case you're not running on the latest Intel chip. And I'm almost running out of time. Um, more open and P4 features that you shouldn't need in your first program. You can now tie a specific thread to a specific core, which is useful in some cases, but in reality it usually is overrated. Don't start using tying threads to cores if you can avoid it. It usually kills your performance. Uh, same as for team, and I already explained what cancel cancellation points are. They are for early access. We have two minutes left to go, pros and cons. I love OpenMP, it's easy. And like C, I can kill myself if I want to. <laughs> it's very easy to shoot yourself in the foot because the compiler will not tell you if you forget something. It will happily create non-working code. If it works, it works great. If it fails, you don't know. But it will run fast. <laughs> okay, thank you for listening. I think we have a couple of questions already. We have time for one more question. Ik kan niet zien, dat hij meer interactief wordt, dan kan je er wel op. En hij zo altijd picture in picture genomen. Slides en hem. Ja. ja? Okay. Maar niet, nee, al kun je slides doen niet. Nee. Okay. Want omdat hij echt interactief was. Ah ja, komt hè. Ah, dat is goed. Ik ah. ga zien achter de achter zoek nieuw voor u zitten. Ik denk dat mijn dek is. Hi man, how are you doing? I have slides. Hi, Hi. Oh, good, man. Hello. Hi, you're doing your I'm supposed to, yes. I'm not sure if it works. We're trying. So the room was quite small. Hello. Hi. 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 H
So you're recording all the talks. It's going to be I don't embarrassing. Know. It's supposed to be recorded. I'm just sitting here and I'm occasionally manipulating the camera. Just if you're speaking, don't walk around too much. Because I was telling you that. Yeah. And I don't understand really well how the city is. Yeah. Well, at first they said somebody would be here to okay. do this stuff, and then it turned out it didn't. And then can I try to fetch the equipment? And then I went for a quick introduction <laughs> to the main hall okay. during the opening talk. But I don't really understand. Now you're the AV guy. Yeah, yeah apparently. <laughs> I'm first gonna fetch a sandwich because I'm not gonna do that. Oh. Oh. Das ist schon ein How to work it? Yeah, so this side. Okay. You that mic? Yep. This one. Okay. Um, it's actually quite loose. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 Are we not going to stack the block? Okay, yeah. normally yeah. that should be working. I think. That means you get the sound. Like the guy who, who, didn't, who didn't get scared, uh, who didn't get had, had a background check. Yeah, one guy who worked for the all the around and how they all love and how they feel it. Really, you know, I don't know what you guys are doing. Thank you. 
Si, si tu as le truc qui change ici, c'est bon. Hein. Tu vois, là, s'il y a ça, c'est bon. Hein. Ouais, c'est bon. Ok. okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you can see the level is up. It's okay. Okay, thank you.